Well, here we are. One way, a little over 50 miles from home. We have not found a single track that looks like it's going to be a wolf. A few elk tracks are the biggest one. so nasty I'd walk over there a little closer. I'll have to do that this summer. But, uh, I found out some about these. Cindy bought me a neat book that uh, talks about all these old graves in the area. One of them, fighting accident. Right, it's the same month, if not the same day. Oh, that wind is cold. <laughs> I should have grabbed my coat, but the truck's not too far away. But whoo wee. Anyway, here's what I found out about those. Finally home and getting warmed up. Holy smokes, was that cold. Um, <laughs> today is the next day. Beautiful blue skies. I gotta run up the mountain again when I when I pulled out my whoo what happened here? When I pulled out my snares the other day, uh, I didn't pull them out. I just wrapped them around the trees and tied them so they're up out of reach. The loops are closed. They're <clears throat> they're still there, but they're not in any way anything can get caught. Uh, got to talking with a couple of friends, and the one friend told me that that wasn't legal, that I still had to check them, even if they weren't set. And I thought, well, that's a that's a dumb rule. And in the past, I have uh, snapped my Martin boxes and things, snapped the traps inside the... <laughs> what am I trying to say? I snapped the trap and put it into the Martin box, and... Uh, Especially around Christmas time, when I know I'm not going to have a lot of time to get up there and check them, I just I just set them off all off, so they can't catch anything, and then I don't need to go and check them. Well, I'm finding out now that that's not legal. The way the law is worded in Idaho, uh, if you so much as just place a trap, whether it's set or not, you still have to check it every three days or 72 hours. So. That makes no sense. I mean, if it can't catch anything, it can't catch anything. But anyway, I just found out that that's the way the law reads. So i got to go up and pull out those snares today. But uh, anyway, this book here, yesterday we were down looking at those uh, graves and looking for wolf tracks along about a 100-mile loop. And uh, I found one set of tracks that I'm pretty sure were wolf tracks, but there was a snowmobile trailer with a truck parked there, and whatever this was made a couple of circles around that truck and left, so it could have been somebody's hound dog. Uh, a lot of people will have a dog box for mountain lions that is attached to a snowmobile sled, and uh, they take their dog with them then, so it, it's... It's hard to say. It could have been a hound. Anyway, there were those two graves there. Now I wish I'd walked over there a little bit closer and read the names and the dates because uh, it doesn't say in this book. I, I'm pretty sure both of them were uh, in October. And I don't know if they have day dates on them or not, but they were at least the same month, maybe even the same very day. I can't remember now. But anyhow, this is... This is the book. It's a pretty neat one. It's called This Quiet Ground. And it's about these kind of unknown graves in this area, which there are a lot of them. Uh, first off, the town of Forney is kind of where we were. There is an old set of cement stairs. And from what I understand, that was a hotel at one time. And... Uh, this first one here has to do with that. 
says the old mining town of Forney, who is located on Panther Creek near the mouth of Porphyry Creek. Buried near there is Frank O'Connor. Frank lived on a ranch near Forney and ran the, ran the stage line between Yellow Jacket and Forney. In the fall of 1912, he committed suicide, leaving a wife and 12 children. He was a busy boy. Uh, anyway, the story I heard about that was they own the hotel where those cement stairs are. And uh, I guess this lady ran that hotel for at least a couple of years after this. From what I read... I wish I could remember where I read that, but I guess what happened was he had gone into Chalice and got to gambling, lost all his money, and uh, didn't want to go back home and face his wife, so he just did himself in instead. <laughs> well, anyhow, that's kind of an interesting story. If I can, I'll have to find that and go over that one again. But anyway, those other two are on Musgrove Creek here. It says there are two, two graves on Musgrove Creek, about two miles northeast of the town site of Forney, and four miles southwest of the present town of Cobalt. In 1912, Charles O. Scott, a young bachelor in his, of 24 years, lived at Forney and prospected for gold. Also staying in Forney was the Milton, Milton Merritt family of Tommy Jacobson, an or orphan from Butte, Montana. Scott felt sorry for the orphan boy and took him under his wing and the two became fast friends. One morning, during a heavy October snowfall, Scott and Tommy set out for deer hunting, about three or four miles from Forney. Visibility was very poor, and Tommy, hunting along the ridge, mistook his friend for a deer and shot him. Upon discovering his mistake, the boy ran all the way back to Forney for help, arriving exhausted and heartbroken. Scott was brought back to town, but he died before the doctor arrived. About the same time, Ernest Minert and Neil Stewart were working in the Musgrove Mine, located about a mile up that creek. The two men had spent the morning blasting in arrays. They had set 14 charges, but only nine of which went off, so that, so that as long so that as long were going down, Stewart turned only half of the usual amount of air, nor... Yeah. The amount of air normally required to drive out the gas. When they returned after lunch, Stewart went up first, and Minard followed shortly after, only to encounter the other man returning hurriedly down the ladder with the air hose close to his face. Quickly, Minard stepped into a drift to let him pass, but as he did so, Stewart, evidently overcome by gas, lost his grip on the ladder and, and tumbled... tumbled... 100 feet to his death. A deep mine, at least for the around here. Minart over Minart himself was overcome in descent at the 30 foot level and fell unconscious onto Stewart's body. Shortly afterward, the two bodies were discovered and pulled out of the mine by Oliver Dupree. Minart was unhurt, and the jury found that Stewart's death was due to his own negligence. Neil Stewart was about 50 four years old, supposedly from Gibbonsville. He had worked only four shifts at the mine. Both Scott and Stewart were laid to rest on a little knoll at the mouth of Musgrove Creek, about 100 yards from the main road to Forney. The frozen ground only allowed for very shallow graves, and the bodies had to be dug up and buried again the following spring. Wayne O'Connor, an old-time Lemhi County resident and a, and a mere youngster at the time, remembers that the bodies were placed side by side about six feet apart from that fence built by O'Connor's brother in closing the site. Over the years, the fence deteriorated and grazing sheep trampled the, the graves into obscurity. Quite by accident, they were discovered again only a few years ago when the excavation project from the Forest Service dug up the, body, dug up the bones. Digging ceased immediately and four posts were set to mark the site so once again Scott and Stewart might raise, rest in peace on Musgrove Creek. No, well, that's <laughs> that's just one of a lot of stories in here. It's actually really pretty neat. This one here, Moyer Creek, is just right across the road from there. And uh, that's a neat story too. But maybe this summer, if anybody is interested, I'm going to go and try to find some of these places and 
look around. I'll have more about that out of this book. But it's history, <laughs> you know, ancient Roman history or ancient whatever history and places I can never go to. I've never had any real interest in. But local history to me is really interesting. And of course, it's local for me. You folks, maybe not. But uh, this kind of stuff's kind of fun if you can go and see it with your own eyes. But for now, I gotta run up the mountain. See ya.